um, let me just start by letting, making sure everyone knows that you'll pick up your midterm books in section this week. You can go to any section you want. So if you're anxious, you can go to the first one today. Uh, Nick uh, has uh, all of the books, and he'll go over the correct answers, the incorrect answers. Uh, and if there are any questions, if the addition is wrong, if there's something wrong with the grading, it's in section that you should talk to Nick about that. After you pick up your book in section, at the end of the section, we, we close the books on the midterm, we move onwards. There may not be finality in the American legal system, but there is finality here. Uh, and so make sure you pick up the book in section and uh, check out any problems. Now, what I was talking about last time was this interesting phenomena in the Malthusian world of survival of the richest. Uh, it's a phenomena that we can document in England all the way from 1250 onwards. Uh, historians from Germany and Scandinavia uh, have also found evidence of exactly the same kind of uh, phenomena where the, the richest people in the society are doubling their share in the population in each generation. We don't have a lot of evidence from the hunter-gatherer world, but what we see there is that amongst groups like the Ache, for example, successful hunters produce more children. And so it seems to be a generalized phenomenon. It's something we would expect in this Malthusian world as a consequence of the model is that those who succeed in commanding resources succeed in producing more children. But one of the things that we do see in the hunter-gatherer world, at least amongst the Yanomamo, is that one of the way you command resources is by being good at violence. And the way goods are distributed in this society, successful men tend also to be men who are successful in war. And we see that also, by the way, in New Guinea, even in the last couple of hundred years, that the leaders in these villages are also the ones who are brave in the struggles with the other villages. And so the interesting thing is that in the hunter-gatherer world, it seems like violence is important as a path to success. There's a very violent world. If you get to something like England, even by the Middle Ages, violence has become relatively unimportant. The market is the way that goods are distributed, and the legal system is the way that they're passed on from one person to the other. And so what's interesting is that there's this possibility that somehow the things associated with reproductive success actually changed in the pre-industrial world as we moved up towards the Industrial Revolution. And that in the earliest societies, violence and conflict are very important, whereas in a society like England, it's the ordinary commercial activity that's the source of people's reproductive success. And the way this shows up dramatically is that we also have studies of the democracy of the very top aristocracy in England all the way back till the Middle Ages. The reason we have that is that these people kept records of their lineage. They're very proud of their lineage. And so they would keep an account of their ancestors and uh, who was born, who died, and when. And what's interesting is that we don't get the replacement rate here is simply the number of sons for every father in this population, or the number of daughters for every mother, right? So it's simply, and so a replacement rate of one means that you replace yourself in the next generation. If it's greater than one, you're being reproductively success, more successful. If it's less than one, you're dying out. <coughs> so for the earliest period, we don't actually, they, they have so few numbers, they can't calculate the replacement rate. But one of the things that they can calculate is uh, life expectancy at birth. And so amongst this, and this is an immensely wealthy group. This is the ducal families of England. So these are the, the people just below the king that we're talking about. <clears throat> What's interesting is that the men in this population have a life expectancy at birth which is lower than the, for the general population. And the reason for that is that 26% of them in the medieval period actually died violently. And this is violence in foreign wars, internal wars by murder and assassination. So this is a dangerous class to belong to in England with relatively low life expectancy. From 1480 to 1679, we get the replacement rate 
calculation. And whereas the rich merchants in England in this period were leaving two surviving sons each, the upper aristocracy is barely replacing itself. And their life expectancy is still very low. For the general population in England in this period, life expectancy would be something like 35 at birth. Uh, for the aristocrats, it's actually low. And the reason is that there's still considerable numbers of death from violence. In this period, the average man in England would have something like a 1% chance of dying violently. And so what's interesting about England is that the strategy of violence and political conflict and high intrigue is actually a strategy that's very unsuccessful reproductively in terms of replacing your genes in the population. It's the ordinary commercial classes, the, the middle class, that's actually taking over in this society as opposed to these high political classes. And then we can fill in the rest of this table. We see that even into the 18th century, in this period, they're actually declining in numbers, this high aristocracy. And then finally, on the eve of the Industrial Revolution, they start to have what looks like more like the normal reproductive success in the society. And their life expectancy similarly expands quite considerably in the period leading up to the Industrial Revolution. And a lot of this is to do with the fact that the fraction of these men dying violently is actually declining very considerably. Uh, but what's interesting, as I say, is that the hunter-gatherer world seems to be a world where potentially violence is very important in reproductive success. The interesting thing about England is that Economic success is very strongly linked to reproductive success, but not amongst this aristocratic class. It's actually amongst the middle classes in the society. So that's the first thing that we observe is this phenomena of survival of the richest. The second question comes up is, could that have changed the characteristics of the pre-industrial population? Over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, could that have actually changed the way people behaved culturally? Or could it even potentially have changed people genetically uh, over very long periods? Right? Because you have some of these settled agrarian societies like China, <coughs> which are sitting in place for 3,000 or 4,000 years. And the question is, are these mechanisms in the Malthusian era, could they actually potentially have changed the characteristics of people by going through this long experience of survival of the richest. And for that possibility, what we have to have is that there's an inheritance of characteristics between fathers and sons. Right? If what happens is that in each generation, some people just get lucky. It's like we have a lottery. Right? Some people win the lottery, others don't but there's no difference between them and the general person in the population, then the fact that more of their children survive would have absolutely no influence on the population in the long run. And so the first thing that we need to know is, are the sons of rich men in pre-industrial England also tending to be economically successful, or do they immediately look just like the general population? And it turns out, with this data on wills, you can actually find a whole group of fathers and sons who both left wills, and the answer is that rich men have rich sons, that there is this connection. And in fact, the connection seems to be closer than even in the modern world. It actually varies across modern societies, the degree to which you can predict children's wealth from their father's wealth or income. It's relatively high in the United States, but there are some societies such as Sweden where there's relatively low ability to predict wealth. And we think of that, it's a very egalitarian society. And so that your, your chances in life are not particularly strongly affected by what your parents were doing. In something like the United States, it's, it's more predictive that if you have rich parents, will also have rich children. And so that's the first thing we need. And the answer is that there's a pretty close connection. There's a, like a 0.7 correlation between the wealth of sons and the wealth of fathers. And so we know potentially <laughs> Fathers could have some difference from the general population and that they're passing that on to the sons. The second way we see that also is just within the wills, we can look at, well, how many grandchildren are mentioned in the wills of rich men? Is it 
even greater than the numbers of grandchildren mentioned in the wills of the poor men. That is, are their children already showing up as having lots of children themselves? And the answer again is yes. Uh, rich men seem to have many, many more grandchildren than poor men. So that there is something that's being transmitted between fathers and sons in pre-industrial England connected with their, their economic success. But there's still three possible mechanisms of transmission. The first is that it's just the wealth it said itself that's being passed on. The second is that it's culture. And the third is that it's genes. Okay? So again, even if there is this transmission, another possibility would just be the following. In medieval England, a group of people, the Normans, uh, conquered England, took over the wealth of the society, took over the land. They had the wealth. They weren't any different than the general person in the population, but they transmitted that from generation to generation, and you got this persistent wealth-holding class. And also, they expanded their share in the population. They gradually moved downwards, but there was nothing different between them and anyone else. They just had the wealth. Right? There's a famous interchange that actually didn't take place, that was alleged to have taken place, between F. Scott Fitzgerald, the novelist, and Ernest Hemingway, where Hemingway is supposed to have said very wistfully, uh, you know, Scotty, the rich are different from you and me. And Fitzgerald was supposed to have answered, yes, they've got more money. Uh, and so there's one, this is the first possibility, which is that you're just observing here the perpetuation of inequality, but it's purely based on wealth. Okay? Um, we can actually check again in this data if that's the way success is transmitted in this society. And the reason we can check that is that the numbers of children that men left in, this war, uh, in pre industrial England actually varied between 0 and 15 in the data that we have. So for the thousands of cases we have, some men, a lot of men left zero children, some left 15 surviving children. Okay. Now, for those who are going to have surviving sons, that number is going to vary between actually 1 and 15, right? Because you have to have at least one son in order to pass on wealth to them. But what should happen if it's the wealth that matters is, suppose I'm in a lucky family. I'm the son where I'm the only child. Then I will get all the wealth of my father, and I should have a wealth that's very close to their wealth. But suppose I'm in an unlucky family where there are 15 surviving children, and the wealth is divided up across all 15 of us. Then we should rapidly become much poorer. We should be moving down very quickly if all that matters is wealth. So it turns out then we can just look empirically and say, how good a predictor of how wealthy will you be relative to your father is the number of children there were in that family? And the answer is, it does help predict. Right? The more you have to divide up the wealth, the, the less wealthy the children will be. But of that 0.7 correlation between father's wealth, and son's wealth, only 0.2 of it can actually be directly traced to the amount of money that the father passed on to the child. Right? The rest of it, the other 0.5 of the correlation, is because somehow sons are like their fathers, but it's not just the wealth that was given to them. Right? So it's only about a third of it is actually explained by the fact, well, you just got this gift of wealth that other people didn't get. And the, the two-thirds of it, is actually coming from there's some characteristic that these sons have that they share with their fathers that's making them economically successful. The question then that comes up is, well, is this purely a cultural phenomenon? That you know, if I grow up in the house of a rich farmer, I learn about farming, I, I learn how to manage things, I get educated, I get training, right? Or could that to some extent be a genetic phenomenon? And there's a huge debate in the modern world about the extent to which characteristics of people are actually genetic as opposed to cultural. It's this long, kind of uh, unresolved uh, debate. But we actually know in the modern world that rich people are genetically different from poor people. It's a kind of surprising and stunning <laughs> fact to state. But we actually know from clear evidence 
that the rich are genetically different from the poor in, in all societies. And one of the ways we know that is because of twin studies. There are two types of twins. There's uh, monozygotic twins, where uh, they, they come, they're identical twins, they come from the same egg. And dizygotic twins, where there's two eggs are fertilized in the womb, but it, they're just born at the same time, right? And monozygotic twins are 100% genetically identical, dizygotic are 50%, they're just like siblings. Uh, what you can then do is look at how well correlated are things like the education level, the IQ, the earnings of identical twins as versus uh, fraternal twins. <clears throat> and from that, we actually know that about half of the, that, that identical twins are much more closely correlated than fraternal twins, right? Even though, as I say, in other respects, their life looks very, very similar. They grew up in the same cultural environment. And so it, that, those studies seem to suggest about half of economic success can actually be attributed to your genes. Uh, that, that half of it is that and half of it is culture. Now, it's a much more complicated phenomenon because there's an interaction between genes and culture. So the share of genes versus culture will vary depending on how much cultural variation there is within societies. But the interesting thing is that we actually know in the modern world that there's a lot of genetic components to economic success. A second group of studies that suggest this are ones that have been done in Scandinavia. And one of the characteristics of Scandinavia is that they don't seem to have the same fear of government collecting information about people. So for example, I believe in Sweden that everyone's tax returns are public. Uh, and so that uh, you have this uh, kind of huge information collecting apparatus in these Scandinavian countries. And so there's a nice study, for example, in Sweden of adopted children, where they have in this study the record of the years of education of the biological mother and father, and of the adoptive mother and father, and then of the children, right? And education is very highly correlated with e economic outcomes in the modern world. And then they can just say, well, what's the predictor of how much education this adopted child will get? You would think if it's all a function of culture, all that would matter is well, what kind of family was that child placed in? If it's all a function of genetics, you would think it only matters what your biological parents were like. And the answer that comes in is fairly consistent is it's about one-third culture, it's about one-third the family you were placed in, and about two-thirds is what the education level was of your biological parents, right? And so it turns out that both of these forces seem to matter, but the interesting thing is that both of these actually seem to play a role and that there's quite a significant role for genes in terms of even such basic things as economic success. Another study that was done in Denmark, and this is, uh, using a, a panel of data for the, the, a large fraction of the 20th century. And what they had here was records of adoptive children and whether they were likely to end up being convicted of a crime or not over the course of their lifetime. And they also knew for their biological parents, had they ever been convicted of a crime? And for their adoptive parents, had they ever been convicted of a crime? And so you had, in the end, a kind of four-way schema so here you have the adoptive parents. And here you have the biological parents. Okay. And it's just, have either of them been convicted of a crime? And uh, this is convicted and not convicted, convicted and not convicted, right? So these are unfortunate children who had biological parents who were convicted of crime and then ended up with adoptive parents who were also convicted of crimes, right? And then you've got uh, fortunate children whose biological parents never were convicted and whose adoptive parents were never convicted of a crime. And then what we want to do here is, well, what's the percentage of these children who would actually eventually be convicted of a crime? Now, one thing that's surprisingly high is that even when both parents were not convicted of crimes, 13.5% of them ended up with some kind of criminal conviction over the course of their life, right? 
And I, that presumed this includes relatively minor ones like public drunkenness and um, things like that. And then, well, what happens then if your uh, biological parents were not convicted of a crime, but your adoptive parents were convicted of a crime? And the answer is that your probability of a criminal conviction went up, but just by a very modest amount. Then we could ask, well, what happens if your biological parent was convicted of crime, but your adoptive parents were not convicted? And the answer there is that, again, your probability goes up, but by a much greater amount in this case. When you go from here to here, the effect is much greater when you look at the biological parents as opposed to the adoptive parents. And then what happens if both are convicted? <laughs> and the answer then, again, is, well, it does have this compounding effect. There's much greater chances then that the children will end up convicted of a crime. But in general, what happens is that the adoptive parents overall increase the chance, if they're criminal, the chances that their children will be convicted of a crime go up by 2.8%. Whereas if you look at the biological, it turns out that that adds an 8.1% to the probability that the children will be convicted of a crime. And so the interesting thing we know about the modern world is that people's economic success, people's social success, that are both cultural and biological, uh, genetic elements to it, the evidence seems to be that the genetic component is very substantial uh, and potentially is the majority of uh, uh, success in the modern world. But as I say, that's going to vary across societies depending on the structure of that society. If you have a society which, which is class-ridden, which is very little opportunity for social mobility, then it might well be that the cultural element really plays a dramatic role, right? Whereas if you have a society of tremendous economic opportunity, equal schooling being provided to people, in that case, it can be that the genetic element will actually come to be much more significant because the cultural components that people are inheriting from their parents are actually mattering less in that society. And so it turns out that both of these are important, and the implication is that these processes in the pre-industrial world would actually be changing people genetically. Whether it matters or not, we don't know. But that over generation after generation of this, that it would be changing the genetic composition of these pre-industrial populations. And that potentially, we were going to be quite a lot different by the eve of the Industrial Revolution than the original hunter-gatherers simply as a result of the fact that people who had genes that were kind of adapted to functioning in modern market economies uh, were actually going to do better economically and produce more surviving children within these societies and that those traits would actually be passed on within the society. Now, you might think, a lot of uh, times we would think that uh, genetic change can only really be significant if it's over a course of a million or a hundred thousand years, right? That you, it takes an extraordinary amount of time to develop things like a, an opposable thumb, uh, eyesight, uh, ears. Um, that's true for a lot of traits, but there are a lot of things about people where there can be just a natural variation within the population, and then if there's any selection process operating on that, you can actually have very quick movement towards different characteristics. And so one of them that we're actually going to come and talk about, which is one very interesting change that happened in the pre-industrial world, is how impatient people were. And it turns out that that's a characteristic that varies very sharply across, reasonably sharply still across modern individuals. Uh, and you can measure it, it turns out, in children. Uh, and it's also a characteristic that declines with age. And, and it's, it's further a characteristic that economics kind of struggles with because it, it doesn't seem that it's something that's completely rational. We have this well-known characteristic that we value current consumption more highly than future consumption. But the argument is that any rational individual would say, well, look, if you're going to live for 50 years, 
why would it matter that I got to consume that in year 10 as opposed to year 12? Right? Shouldn't it just matter that I get to consume it at some time? Why would it matter to me that consumption comes earlier? But the fact, the, the reason we have a positive interest rate in modern societies is largely because there's this systematic impatience by people. That impatience, we also know, varies with people's wealth within modern societies. Poor people tend to have high measured rates of impatience. Rich people tend to be much more patient in, in the modern world. Okay? And so we know it's a characteristic that still varies across the population. Uh, I have uh, three children, and I can tell you, even within the same household, you can see dramatic variations in that across individuals. It's part of people's personality is uh, how much they need to th have things now and how much they're willing to wait. Okay? And then typically, you are a self-selected group of relatively patient people right? because you're willing to endure uh, the burdens of education, the numbing boredom you know, inflicted day after day in order to get the higher rewards uh, at the end of this process. And so something like that, if there is a natural variation in the population, then these selection processes can actually change the population quite significantly, even within 10, 15 generations. Right? If it's just choosing amongst a set of pre-existing characteristics. And we actually see within the pre-industrial period that there are quite significant genetic differences between some populations that seem to be the result of the environment, but just the environment since settled agriculture arrived. And so the, the most dramatic of these is uh, lactose tolerance amongst uh, adults. Uh, in the, the hunter-gatherer population, it's very rare for people to be able to ingest milk uh, once they've passed childhood. You need a particular genetic mutation in order to do that. Amongst northern Europeans, 95 to 99 percent of the population has that uh, mutation and has that ability. And we know that there was a long tradition of eating animal products and consuming milk in adulthood in European society. We know it's a relatively rich pre-industrial society. And we think that that's just an adaptation to the fact that people who could do that got better nutrition, did better within this early society. If you go to uh, China, only 5% of adults have that ability to uh, uh, consume milk as, and ingest milk as, uh, and, and sorry, yeah, uh, as adults. Um, and we again think that that is probably just a reflection of the fact that the diets in Asia incorporated very few milk products for millennia in the past, as far as we know, and that that may just be the result of people m living much closer to the physical subsistence level uh, within these societies. And you'll find amongst Native Americans that that ability is completely absent. Amongst African Americans, only 15% have lactose tolerance. Australian Aboriginals, only 15% have this. Uh, Southern Europeans have less ability to do this than Northern Europeans. It's only about 50% Southern Europeans. And again, animals were much less commonly kept in Southern Europe and were much less important as a share of the diet. And so there are actually characteristics that we can observe where you can actually see that just a few, few millennia have had sufficient uh, time to actually change uh, important characteristics about people. And so it does raise this interesting possibility that somehow in the period leading up to the Industrial Revolution, over millennia, people were actually being changed by the environment that they were living in. And in particular, they may have become, we'll see, more patient, much more ad uh, addicted to work as opposed to leisure and actually also less violent over this time. That it's somehow that they were, they were being selected for these characteristics and that in some sense the population in these societies actually uh, self-domesticated. That we transformed ourselves from, from a, a somewhat different creature in the original hunter-gatherer past into a kind of self-domesticated species. Right? And as I say, I mean, we don't know. Eventually we will know, right? Because we'll have all the genetic evidence in. A lot of this process also may be purely cultural. That is, it's just a transmission of values from one generation to the next. But it raises these interesting, and it raises also this unsettling possibility that within the modern world, not all groups may actually be able to compete equally 
that there are characteristics of some populations that will favor them in economic competition with other groups. And in particular, the longer the history of the market and of settled agriculture within a society, the greater will be their ability to function within modern market economies. And we'll come back and talk about that, but it is uh, a feature of the modern world that very few hunter-gatherer societies have actually successfully made a transition to a modern commercial world without a lot of social problems and without having great difficulties actually achieving economic success. And the most dramatic example of that is Australian Aboriginals, who were a group who never had settled agriculture, but who then, in 1788, with the arrival of the English convicts <laughs> and the guards for the convicts, were very rapidly transformed into a very modern market economy, uh, and where there's just been a dramatic difference in economic success between these different groups. And it's stunning that you know Australia, a language where a country where English is the national language, there's still a large fraction of Aboriginals who don't speak English as a native language, right? And and which is amazing, given that it's actually a requirement of the school system uh, learning English uh, that these groups have actually managed to be so isolated that they, they don't have uh, uh, basic uh, literacy in the, the, the language uh, of the country. Uh, and so, it, as I say, it, it does raise these interesting issues about what well, was that part of the story of how the Industrial Revolution was so long delayed was that you needed more just than market societies and settled agriculture, you needed people also to have changed in this process. Now, we'll come back to these issues, but before we do that, one other thing I wanted to look at in pre-industrial England, and this is on the reading that's on the syllabus, was, well, what was the consequence of this pattern in terms of social mobility within English society in the pre-industrial period? It seems to suggest that the modern English would be largely descended from some original upper class, and that uh, mobility in the pre-industrial world would almost always be downwards, uh, and that there really would be these persistent kind of upper classes within the society, right? The fact that sons' wealth was so closely uh, uh, correlated with their fathers, the fact that the rich were producing more children than the poor, and it looks like that when we get some of the data from the medieval period. And so there's a village in England, Hills Own, where from 1270 to, it actually goes much later than 1348, but in this first period, 1270 to 1348, a historian, uh, Zvi Razi in uh, Israel, went through the court records and tried to trace every family within this village for 300 years. Okay. And people show up in medieval court records for all kinds of things. If you, if you brew ear, uh, beer, you have to pay a fine. It's just a standard payment, and so you show up in the records. If your animal strays into someone else's field, you'll show up in the court records. So the court records are this rich record of these villages. And with incredible effort, it's possible to actually construct for these villages a kind of a complete social history of the village uh, over these years. And so what Razi did was to take 1270 to 82 and divide families into those that were rich, those that were middling, and those that were poor. Okay, and you can tell from these court records if someone has land, they'll show up in a certain way in the records. If they have no land, they'll show up in a different way. And so these were occupiers of land, but there were some families that were rich, some families that were middling, and some families that were poor. And here were the numbers in this early period. And then what he did in 1348, and the reason we go to 1348 is that after that, remember, the Black Death comes in and wipes out a large fraction of the population, and so it's going to completely interrupt a lot of this inheritance within the village. Then he can ask, well, how many of the rich families still had people who held land in the village in 1348? And the answer for the rich families was that all 40 of them, three generations later, 
were still landholders within the village. For the middling families, they went down from 54 to 60, from 64 to 58. But the interesting thing is the poorest families went down from 70 to 25. And so you can actually see again in the medieval period that the rich seem to persist and the poor are disappearing from the records. Now they may just have left the village, they may just have migrated. So with the study of just at this particular village, that's the problem is that you just see what's happening within the village. But you do see this process and it seems to suggest somehow, well there is this persistent class of the rich and then they're replacing the poor at the bottom end of the social spectrum. But it turns out that that actually is a false impression of what social life was like in pre-industrial England and probably in many other pre-industrial societies. It turns out that we can actually show that there's a lot of poor people still within this society who are moving up into the classes of the rich. And that there's actually movement is going all the way up and down <laughs> within this early society, and that amazingly, all the way back till the medieval period in England, this is actually a society of complete social mobility. That the rich people, within four or five generations, their children will look like the average person in the society, and the poorest people also, within four or five generations, their children <laughs> will actually look like the average. Then in the long run, at the same time as this survival of the richest, it's quite compatible, actually, with a world of quite complete social mobility. And one of the, the puzzles about this is that it may be that they had greater social mobility in this pre-industrial world than we do in modern America. Because the prediction would be, in any society, if there's an imperfect correlation between fathers and sons, or fathers and daughters in their wealth, is that if that process is applied over a certain number of years, that what will happen is that everyone will regress to the mean. Okay? That if I start out very wealthy, and there's only a 0.7 correlation between my wealth and my children's wealth, that when I get to my grandchildren, that correlation will then drop to 0.49. And then when I get to my uh, uh, great-grandchildren, it would drop to something like 0.35, right? And that within, that's within three generations, within four generations, you'll get down to the point where the, quickly, within a certain amount of time, where there's no correlation between your wealth and the wealth of your great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren. So that no matter how wealthy you start off with, your children will look like the average. And again, no matter how poor you start off with, your children will look like the average. In America, by the way, that correlation between generations is only something like 0.4. So that implies that within two generations, you're at 0.16. And within uh, three generations, if I have to do my multiplication, you're at 0 0.06, right? That there's very rapid return of everyone to the mean, or there should be if there's complete social mobility within this society. Question. Right. Why oh. It's just that if there's going, uh, the question that's raised here is, we can see that the wealthy will move towards the mean. Uh, why do we think that the poor will also move uh, towards the mean? And the idea here is that uh, it's just going to be if we got everyone's income in one generation, and then looked at the income of their children in the second generation, that there'll be this general, if there was complete replication, you'd have that, you'd be on the 45 degree line here. But that typically what we observe in societies is the slope looks like this. And that's what's called regression towards the mean. And so if the slope wasn't going to look like this, we'd have to find in the wealthy that it was like this, and then for the poor, for some reason, there was this complete prediction from the wealth of the parents what the wealth of the children would be. But when you actually see the data, right, whenever you get the data, it actually looks much more like this. So that, and one of the reasons is, if you write down at the bottom of the wealth distribution here, there's no way you can get poorer. <laughs> the only way that accidents can affect you is to start heading upwards, right? And similarly, if you're Bill Gates, it's gonna be very, very difficult for your children to be richer than you are. <laughs> 
in some sense, any accidents are going to have to force them back towards the mean. Okay? And so it's just an empirical observation we get pretty much in all societies of this phenomena of regression towards the mean. And consequently, it's actually been argued by conservative economists, well, why are we worried about social inequality? <laughs> because of this general process, within any society, within three or four generations, the rich, the children of the rich will look exactly like the children of anyone else, and the children of the poor will look exactly like anyone else. What I'm going to show you is that we can show that that process actually operated in pre-industrial England with somewhat unusual evidence about people's surnames. The interesting feature of modern America is that that process does not seem to be operating. The way that we know that that process is not operating is that there are some groups within modern America who are not regressing towards the mean <laughs> in the way that you would expect. So that, for example, uh, there are some ethnic groups, so Jewish Americans, for example, have much higher average incomes, education, everything else than the general population. They emigrated substantially to the US something like three or four generations ago. If they had different characteristics in the general population, by now they should have regressed completely to the mean, if this process was, was actually true within American society. There's also other groups at the bottom end of American society who, again, are, are not regressing in the same way back towards the mean. So black Americans are not regressing in the way that would be expected just by this simple formulation towards the mean. And so it looks like within modern American society that you could actually have a class society where there are, uh, there's an upper class and a lower class. And the popular image that people have of something like pre-industrial England is that it also was a class society where there were these persistent social classes and persistent groups that stayed poor, persistent groups that stayed rich. But it turns out that we can actually show for England all the way back to the Middle Ages that that's not the case, right? And the question is, well, how would we show that over a period of something like 700 years? And here we can use a peculiarity of English surnames. So it turns out that if you go to modern China, there are actually very, relatively very few surnames. Uh, and so a small group of surnames in China describe a very large chunk of the population. And there are also relatively modest number of first names. And so you run into a problem in modern Chinese society that you can have 10 million people who have exactly the same name. Right? Uh, and in pre-industrial England, first names again had this phenomena that they were, didn't vary very much at all. Because the typical pattern was that every father had to call at least one son after himself and one son after his father, if his father had a different name. And so the same names simply got transmitted down through society. And if the first son with that name died, they would call another son that same name. And so four surnames describe more than half the single, sorry, first names describe more than half the male population in pre-industrial England. It's John, Thomas, William. James or something like that, right? And similarly for women, it's Mary, Anne, you know, there's a very small group of names that describe people. But it turns out that for surnames in pre-industrial England, there's in fact incredible variety. You might not think that because you think of common surnames like Smith or my surname Clark, <laughs> uh, and you think, well, that's the characteristic of the English population is that, you know, a, a huge chunk of people have these common surnames. But it turns out that in modern England, there's something like one and a half million surnames. And something like 40% of the population, it's claimed, have unique surnames in modern England. There's very large numbers of surnames in England that are held by very, very few people that are often dying out. Uh, and it's uh, somehow the process of surname generation, and in part, surnames were used to distinguish people and so they would choose names deliberately that were different from anyone else in the village. And so you get, in England, this huge numbers of very rare surnames. And some of them are quite funny. And you think it must have been one specific incident that led to this family ending up with this name. And so amongst the ones that we find in the wills are someone whose surname is Gather Cole, uh, another person whose surname is Hogsflesh. Uh, there's another, 
person whose surname is, and this is actually a reasonably common surname, uh, actually not that uncommon, is Free Love. Uh, there's another family whose surname was Spill Timber. Uh, and so there are some of these descriptors. Another person whose surname was Face Brown. <laughs> and some of these presumably came from some odd characteristic of original people, but this is back. Surname formation was typically in 1300 in England. Uh, you can observe in the 19th and 20th century some of these things that are transmitted in, in the same way. Now, the other characteristic of English surnames is that they pass unchanged from father to sons. So that what the surnames actually do is they trace out the Y chromosome in English history. And there's relative, remember, there's very little illegitimacy in English society. And so the surnames actually are this trace then that if we find someone with a certain surname in 1300, we will often be able to find here's all of their relatives 700 years later going through the male line. Right? So it's only the ones who are going through the sons to, to sons. Uh, so a bunch of them then have this form that they're rather unusual. But there's a lot of surnames in England that are very rare that turn out to look just like average surnames. So, you know, this is a surname held by almost no one in England. We can check this because th they've computerized the censuses, the early census in England, and so there are lists of every name that someone held in England in 1881, 1851, 1841. And so you get many of these surnames that are, turned out are very unusual, but look just like any standard English sur surname. Another one here is Aldham turns out to be very rare, okay? So there are some that are peculiar and rare, and, and most of the rare ones are just, they look like perfectly normal English surnames, but it turns out that almost no one holds these surnames. And so what can we do with the rare surnames? Well, what we can do is we can go to England in 1600 and find two groups of people, two groups of men. We can find a group of rich men with very rare surnames. And then we can find a group of people who are really unsuccessful economically and socially. And those are people who were indicted for crimes in the courts around about 1600. Okay? And it turns out that the, you know, the rich tend to be literate. They have a lot of money. These are guys who are leaving wills, and they're very substantial people. But it turns out that they have rare names, and so that very few other people will hold this name as well, and most of the other people holding it will be related to them. And then, as I say, we get a similar group where we go to the court records and say, here's some people with rare names, and, and the people in the court records, a very large fraction of them have an occupation of laborer, a very large fraction are illiterate. They're being accused, a lot of them, of just minor offenses, drunkenness, uh, stealing sheep, uh, stealing cloth, stealing sixpence, uh, beating someone with a, on the head with a cudgel. Uh, and so these really are kind of the opposite extremes of English society at that time. But as I say, we just go through there and we choose. And the way we know which have the rare names, which don't have the rare names, is that someone in 1911 went through the parish registers of England in 1601, went through 10% of all the parish registers, and wrote down all the surnames that were recorded there. And so the only people we keep in this list are those who don't show up in that 10% sample, so that they have a very rare name in England in this period. And then what I'll show you, we run out of time now, what I'll show you next time is we can then look at their descendants in 1851 and see how many of them were there. And what you'll see is that there is survival of the riches, that people who are rich with rare surnames have many more descendants. But the second thing we can ask is, well, what were their descendants doing by 1851? And what we'll find is that there's complete regression towards the mean. The descendants of the rich, 250 years later, look identical to the descendants of the criminal in this early period, that there really is this complete social mixing that's going on in pre-industrial England. And then after that, I'll go on and show you that we can show this same process from 1300 to 1600, so that pre-industrial England is actually a world of complete social mobility in the long run.